Heavy Metal was sort of my gateway to the idea of animation for adults, and yeah, that in itself can be apocryphal to a certain degree. There shouldn't really be a barrier for entry to folks watching animated features or shorts, but until society kind of gets it, we will always have to live with the stigma that cartoons are mostly made for children. Without getting too hung up on it, adult animation seems to be an appealing compromise. What better way to distinguish yourself from the majority than to show things you really can't show to kids? Sex, gore, and tons of suggestive and inappropriate content not intended to be watched by a young demographic. However, there will always be a counter to it. If the material is too exaggerated and too out there in its execution, then it can resemble a problem child's immature imagination, devoid of reason or art. And when I said I was introduced to it by Heavy Metal, I mean its sequel. Heavy Metal 2000, not the call hit from the 80s. And also not a good way to introduce a teenager to adult animation, cause that film sucked so fucking much. But sweep that aside, and I soon grew to appreciate adult-oriented television shows that used animation to get away with things live-action can't do. Not here in the West, but the East. Anime like Elf and Lee were high-octane gory slash lewd shows that were fun to watch as a teen, but much like an edge of a sword, it began to rust when I actually grew out of that angsty phase of my life. Cause now, reminiscing about Elf and Lee, I find it to be too melodramatic and a little bit creepy. I mean, I'm not the only one thinking about that scene with the main character and his cousin dry humping in the rain. Gross. Meanwhile in the West, Family Guy, South Park, and others had their fair share of adult content, but usually weren't able to experiment further beyond the sitcom format. Mostly because companies had to market to a certain weekend viewership, and going beyond the occasional cursing or suggestive situations was out of the question. There seemed to be no happy medium. The only option was to go direct to DVD, but that presented very limited exposure for the general public to catch it. That is, until March of 2019 came around, when David Fincher, director of Seven and one of my favorite movies of all time, The Social Network, and Tim Miller of Deadpool fame, came together and presumably one day got baked in an apartment to make a sequel to the original Heavy Metal. What they gave us wasn't a sequel, but a spiritual successor that was tried to solve one burning question. Can adult animation be taken seriously? Answer is... No, but it can sure as hell be a fucking blast to watch. Love, Death, and Robots is a collection of 18 animated shorts from the pockets of different studios and directors, but instead of being based on stories from the heavy metal comics, it instead adapts stories from well-known sci-fi authors like Alistair Reynolds, Ken Liu, John Scalzi, just to name a few. Ranging from dark comedy to hardcore action fests, the episodes each have a distinct difference to each other. And in the end, it measures out to what I can only describe as having a nonsensical but rewarding night at a sex club. My experience, what happens in Berlin, stays in Berlin. So, why now? What worked in this adult anthology series that other shows, including the one that was trying to reboot, failed to grasp? Well, my fellow viewers, let's figure it out. Looking at the qualities that worked, and the misses that can be adjusted to propel this series to a glorious second season. Love, Death, and Robots. A wet dream of adult animation. Now, if you have ever seen the original Heavy Metal, it was an anthology animated movie loosely tied together by a girl in a glowing space ball. Uh, kind of a weird setup, but that was the 80s. The majority of the feature has a rock telling tales of vastly different sci-fi and fantasy stories, and honestly, they were kind of mixed. Some were neat concepts, but the rest were either chock full of boring, undercooked ideas, or mediocre material that really overstayed their welcome. But what makes up for it is the music, which you are going to nail down regardless with artists like Blue Oyster Cult and Riggs, and its animation a time capsule of maturity that hasn't aged well over the years. Now, with Love, Death, and Robots, it improved on many things. For instance, going for an episodic route like Black Mirror, and partnering with Netflix for distribution. This is good for two things. One is that, like Black Mirror, you have the option to either play the series for the entire 18 holes, or pick and choose. Plus, with the option to even scramble the order of the episodes, it grants a ton of freedom for viewers' preferences. No longer will you have to sit and just fast forward to parts that are just boring. Now you can just click and there you go. You can watch whatever episode you best want to sift for without any interruptions. Secondly, Netflix is by far the best network outside of HBO that can give the showrunners and animation houses little to no limits to their episodes. That means they can show all the blood, guts, and mayhem that they can logically get away with. And from watching the show multiple times for this video, I can tell you, they got away with a lot of stuff. It's so extreme, 
I think D.B. Weiss and David Benioff are getting kind of blush. Good or bad, Netflix is proving that good television programming doesn't need to be restricted to be fully enjoyed. Devil Man Cry Baby was a sexually driven animal house of violence and lust, but it was critically acclaimed by fans and critics alike, and even made in my top 5 anime of 2018. Castlevania was an insane adaptation of a classic video game franchise, but if not for Netflix's loose policies and their commitment to try anything, the experience would have been neutered in the hands of a more established corporation. It proved to be one of the best shows based on a video game to come out in the past decade, despite being a shockingly gory show about vampires. I'm not going to say Netflix is perfect though, because sometimes that freedom can get you in a lot of trouble, and despite giving a fair thumbs up to some of their practices, their output has been let's just say tolerable in the best of terms. But hey, not all extremes are going to be better than the other, and Love, Death and Robots, at some degree, accomplished what it set out to do. The episodes of Love, Death and Robot are all done by a different director and animation studio, though the most prominent one is Blur Studio, the guys who did the cutscenes for several video game licenses, including Halo. And with directed from presumably Fincher and Miller, they really show their talents. Every episode is uniquely unlike the others. 3D, traditional, and even underground art house. All are well animated with a surprising level of detail, almost to the point where the photorealistic animations are just to that point of breaching the uncanny valley effect, though it thankfully never does. Standouts when it comes to the animation are The Witness, Beyond the Aquila Rift, and The Secret War with The Witness being the most ambitious. Alternating a bunch of animation styles and rotoscoping techniques makes this short very similar to last year's hit animated film Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, which makes sense seeing that director Alberto Mialgo was a visual consultant for the feature. I have a couple things to say about this one in particular, so until then, let's praise a couple of really good shorts, or in my opinion, the personal faves from the collection. Suits combines the high-octane action of Mecha with a warm and neighborly atmosphere, alongside simple yet charming characters to defending their farms from Zerg or, I mean, uh, DB. It's more of a 16 minute summer blockbuster, and there really isn't a lot of depth or nuance in it. Despite that, however, it was engaging from beginning to end, and it builds up the tension as our heroes try to survive, along with a very out of left field twist that adds quite a shock to the otherwise basic plot structure. Basic, but effective and highly recommended for fans of StarCraft 2, for completely unrelated reasons. Good Hunting is a well-told tale of how the myths of our world can slowly become reality under the bolts and steel of our own hubris. Following a decade-spending relationship between a young inventor and a beautiful Hulijin, the story is by far the most fully realized setting out of the 18. It starts with martial arts combat on par with Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and transforms itself into a Frankenstein story packed with gritty material, which can be a bit too gratuitous, but I personally think doesn't harm the beauty of the story. In fact, that's the best word to sum up this short, a transformation of sorts, both emotionally and physically. I won't go into much more detail as this is supposed to be a spoiler free video, but let me tell you this, it's as charming and depressing as you can get without going too far. Only gripe is its length, but that's about it. Everything else was great. But the banger of the whole series is a short called Zima Blue, following the life of a universally acclaimed artist named Zima and the unveiling of his final masterpiece. This one is truly the gem of the collection. It doesn't need excessive nudity, swearing, or violence like the others had. Instead, it relies on visual metaphors and a well-constructed narrative to tackle the subject of purpose. Is the grand plan like Zima's artistry that can fill that hole? Or something smaller but still rewarding? Zima Blue navigates that compelling argument with an ending that I can agree is truly one of a kind. If I can pick one short that needs to be seen to be believed, this is definitely the one. You can find an episode in here that can really connect with you or be as entertaining as the next one. And the one thing you gotta nail with anthologies is viewer engagement and anticipation for the upcoming short. Because even if one short isn't as strong, you still have 17 others to get through, which is a pretty good spanking deal. The biggest detriment to prior anthology films were their unfortunate program or theater format, being that you would have to sit there and watch the boring bits without the option of skipping or watching the shorts in a preferred order. Thanks to digital streaming, anthologies have finally found its healthy compromise. And yeah, Love, Death and Robots is not the first anthology to do so, but it is the first adult animated one to adapt to the times. With that said, Love, Death and Robots isn't a perfect show and does have many faulty wires that can easily crash and burn the whole series for potentially every viewer. Since it is an adult animated feature, it has no fear or restrictions to hold back on some very intense imagery. Body horror, impalements, dirty sex club, dirty languages, cats having intercourse while a vampire's ball sack is blown off by a shotgun. This show is extremely adult, 
or what the production crews think of as adults. Because despite its major hook of being as nasty in your face as it can get away with, it kind of lessens its blows a bit and instead of being mature, it's immature. Like the cringe-inducing dialogue trying to sound cool, or the heavy amounts of female nudity, making this video very hard for me to edit. And not for reasons completely out of my control. I mean, come on. Editing requires two hands. Its content is on par with heavy metal, but while their exploitation is more forgivable due to his age and the time period he was in, seeing sequences of women being used as sacrifices or being attacked by murderers is very unnecessary by today's standards. The biggest offender is without a doubt, The Witness. I admire it more for its style and animation than I do its content because it's a bit ridiculous to say the least and is a major road barrier to people wanting more. It's just too juvenile angsty to be entertaining and while I like what it's trying to do, I'm not everyone. And aside from the visuals, it is one of the weakest in Love, Death and Robots. The other problems for the show are, strangely enough, its format of a packaged series. Much like what I stated previously, you can definitely find your personal diamonds in the roughs, but it's a lot harder than you think. There are shorts like this one about Mad Max robots performing a heist, or an old Hicks story about finding a monster in the dump that aren't as memorable or engaging as the rest, while Ice Age and alternate histories are retreating a ton of the same beats as other better shows. I mean, I know I'm not the only one that thought of Lisa's Petri Dish episode in The Simpsons. And if I'm being quite sincere, the biggest flaw to these episodes are the buildups to confusing or anticlimactic payoffs. For example, Fish Night is another visual marvel about two salesmen who witness the ghosts of the ancient seas in what I describe as a modern twist on the classic Icarus story. Without giving away the ending, it pumps the brakes too soon and doesn't properly conclude the message it was trying to tell. A real shame since the episode in question is a great eye catcher, but with little substance. Love, Death and Robots was definitely a passion project in that it grossly overestimated how far it can take things and where some of the story's impacts are afflicted by the short 8 to 16 minute runtime. But you know, that's the price to pay when you're wanting to go beyond the boundaries of what can be shown on TV. No matter what the flaws are, it's sort of refreshing to see Netflix take a chance in diversing its content into dark places, continuing to support invisible potential that is taking animation to new levels, even if it takes a couple of stumbles along the way. Because the one thing I won't fault Love, Death and Robots in is its ambition. It's not going to be on the same level of Black Mirror or The Twilight Zone when it comes to its meanings. It's a style over substance show that really sells you on it. All the critiques I've had can be remedied for future seasons if the producers tone down just a little bit of the nudity and give some of the shorts a bit more breathing room so they can fully work. If you want to hear what my top list is for the show and just want to go by that, then here are the weakest to best episodes. Blind Spot. Not very memorable or thrilling enough to contend with the other shorts. Would make for a decent Adult Swim cartoon, but regardless, it couldn't hide its own blind spots. The Dump. Someone's junk is another man's treasure, but she'll be hard pressed to find anything in this one besides the monster in the junkyard. Alternate histories. A little bit funny with some of the many ways Hitler dies, but much like the subject, it's a little too repetitive. Sucker of Souls. It's a Hollywood B-movie with some nice animation, but sucks it away with some really mediocre dialogue and a deflated payoff. Also, can never see Dracula again without seeing his dick. The Witness. Direction and animation is really the only highlight holding this one together. The problems of the series can all point to this exploitative mess and much like the woman in the shorts, you'll find some audiences wanting to run away from it. Shapeshifters. A pretty cool werewolf death match near the end, but the implications of prejudice against these things doesn't add up and leaves the whole short whimpering instead of howling. Ice Age. Pretty neat concept, but like South Park said, Lucky 13. The relationship between a pilot and a carrier jet is kind of an odd one, but it has a nice little ending to it. Might not have staked the landing, but it was an interesting watch. Fish Night. The visuals are out of this world and the setup is decent. Needed more time to develop these characters as well as the ending. All in all, a middle of the road short. Or the sea in this particular instance. The Secret War. The last episode in the lineup and the one that looks impressive on a technical level. The climax is bittersweet, and the action is greatly intensified. As for character, not a whole lot, and they don't have enough empathy for viewers to care, but at least ended the season with a bang. Beyond the Aquila Rift, the highest rated episode of the roster, and to be honest, I'm pretty divisive with it. Very much up there in sexual content that can go on for way too long, and the setup has been done before. What makes this a really good story is a build up to one hell of a twist. Not my pick for top 5, but was still pretty damn shocking. 
helping hand. A combination of 127 hours and gravity is familiar territory for those who've watched survival movies. The tension and desperation is gripping, and the situation can give out a feeling of claustrophobia. It was definitely the eeriest one on the list. Makes me not want to go to space. When the yogurt took over, it's freaking sentient yogurt! How strangely stupid, but surprisingly deep this one can go. Very short to watch, but it brilliantly foreshadows humanity's overconfidence and how it can bring us to ruin if we're not careful. Who knew a story about yogurt could be so compelling? Sunny's Edge. The first episode in the series and gave us everything the show promised and delivered. We got the best monster cage fight of all time and a gory twist that I didn't see coming. It's an entertaining start to what would be a pretty good anthology series. Three Robots, the funniest animated short of the bunch. The robots are brilliant in their exchanges, and it even gets brownie points for making a point about causality and the demise of civilizations. Also, there is a nice little reference to exploding kittens. Take it as you will. Suits, simple and not a whole lot of compelling storytelling, but it was well animated, well paced, and the mecha action was silly and fun to witness. A really good short that I could watch over and over again. Good Hunting. This one is going to be mixed for some people, and the graphic scenes are a bit heavy-handed, but the setting, the pacing, the main characters, and the story all work really well. The short goes back and forth from one environment to the next, seemingly without a hiccup, and it ends exactly how I think a tale like this should end. All I can say, it was good hunting. Zima Blue. Easily the most well-written and executed piece, and is one that should not be skipped. Its themes are driven with exploration, and the art style and colors pop like nothing I've ever seen before. It was like seeing a gallery painting take flight, and the climax is poetically uplifting, even if some will view it as horrifying. It's a work of art befitting the title of Zima Blue. In a final summary to this, Love, Death, and Robots is style over substance in many areas of its three-hour runtime, and much like other adult anime works, it can sometimes be hindered by its own expression. But the effort is there, the animation on all the shorts is visually diverse and compelling, and a good portion of the shorts are pretty solid. Hopefully, if this gets picked up for a season two, they could potentially rectify some of the problems I had, but no matter what, I got exactly what the series advertised. So if you want to convince your friends that animation isn't just for kids, Love, Death, and Robots has its shortcomings, but hey, at least it was a hell of a good time. for you tell me everything it's pretty anticlimactic yeah well welcome to humans thanks for watching what are your favorite episodes from love death and robots i want to know down in the comments section also if you like my videos please click that subscription button i'll be coming back to anime stuff pretty soon as we are on the cusp of spring 2019 it's your bra man signing off <laughs>